On your Friday episode of Locked on Raptors, 10% of the season is in the books and we take stock of what we've seen so far, what have we learned, how have our opinions changed, what's the Pascal and Scotty of it all, and we take a look at Dennis Schroeder who has been quietly fantastic for your Toronto Raptors. Will that keep up? We'll get into all that with Joe Wolfond of The Score and Pound the Rock coming up on today's show. Thanks for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Friday, November the 10th. And I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the website that's busted, at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Lockdown Raptors. And, of course, the Lockdown Raptors Discord server is really the place to be. we got, like, 250 sickos just like you who love the Raptors, who love the show, talking about the show, talking about the Raptors, talking about how wrong I am all the time. It's a great place to be among friends. Come hang out. The link is in the description of the podcast. It is free to join, and we'd love to see you in there. Maybe for the game on Saturday against the Boston Celtics, which should be a fun one. Uh, Come hang out. Again, link in the description. Pop into the Discord. Uh, You can also find the show for free wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe, follow, rate, review, etc. We're on YouTube as well. Hit the little notification bell over there, and you'll get notified every single time the episode's about to premiere, which is a great thing because you never want to miss these shows because they're sweet, sweet, hot content. You can't live without uh today's show is also brought to you by prize picks the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports go to prizepicks.com slash locked on nba and use the code uh, all lowercase locked in nba for a first deposit match up to 100 dollars. all right let's get to it it's friday it's an off day for the raptors we got a couple days here to kind of sit and germinate on that uh mavs win germinate ruminate that's the word i'm looking for and we are talking about dennis schroeder today right so maybe the pun was intended (laughs) hey this is the guy the the guy who is good with the words uh that's why we bring you on the show that voice you hear is of course joe wolfond who is here to take stock of the first 10 percent of the toronto raptors schedule from pound the rock from the score joe how the hell are you bud doing all right man how are you I'm great. Uh, I'm enjoying Raptors basketball, which uh, I I think, you know, the the record is what the record is, but it's been interesting. There's been lots of fun stuff and kind of unexpected stuff going down. Uh, And I think maybe we start there. We'll get into Pascal and Scotty, which is kind of the overarching theme and question of this entire season, really. Um, And kind of, uh, I think, building off of a really great piece written yesterday at The Ringer by Danny Chow, which everyone should go and read. uh, I kind of want to dive into the Pascal and Scotty of it all. Uh, and we'll also talk about Dennis Schroeder later on because I've gotten some hate in the comments, not hate, just uh, just polite anger about not talking enough about Dennis Schroeder. Uh, so we'll do that at the end of the show because I want to give the people what they want. But we'll start ten game or eight games into the season, ten percent of the season done. Joe, how what have we learned? And and more, I guess, pointedly, like has your perception of anything on this team changed from what you thought it would be coming into the season like what for you has sort of you know based on what's happened on the floor what has most changed as far as your overall outlook and vision of this team compared to what we were talking about eight games ago uh scotty barnes (laughs) i mean pretty tight (laughs) i i was pretty confident that he was going to have some kind of a bounce back this year Mm -hmm. but I did not see this coming. Yeah. And I think the fact that he has leveled up in basically every aspect of the game has been incredibly encouraging. Like Mm -hmm. it's just, I know it's only been eight games, but you can't fake this, you Mm -hmm. know, like there's nothing, maybe some of it, like the, the the pull-up shooting that's going to come down, right? He's shooting 59% on pull-up jump shots. (laughs) That's not going to sustain, but Everything else that he's doing, the f- from you know the playmaking to the ability to, I mean, this is something he showcased in his rookie season and wasn't quite as effective last year. But like the push shots, the ability to just like whether it's bigger guys or smaller guys, frankly, get his ass into dudes and score with these bully drives up and over again, like defenders of any size or length. The rebounding, I think, has been astonishing so mm-hmm. far. Like whether he's boxing guys out or kind of just coming out of nowhere to 
snatch rebounds away from dudes. Like they, he had one in that Dallas game that was headed straight for Derek Jones Jr. There was like <laughs> seemingly nobody else in his vicinity. And Scotty came out of nowhere to just rip it from him. I think he's been a monster on the glass at both ends, mm-hmm. offensive and defensive glass. And I think maybe the most important revelation for me is Scotty at the five defensively looks very viable right now. Mm -hmm. And if that continues, that is just a monstrous development given what it could mean for him offensively and what it could mean for the Raptors in terms of being able to open things up, get more spacing, more skill on the floor. And look, Jakob Pertl is still a very important piece of this team. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, somewhere down the road, you can see fit to maybe, you know, I don't know how movable that contract is going to be, but like maybe that allows you to say, go and find like a $10 million a year center who is playing 20 ish minutes a game. And, you know, the rest of the time you feel comfortable with Scotty playing the five. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know if it quite gets to that point, but if that can hold and you can run it out for, you know, even 10 or 15 minutes a game, if it can be, your closing lineup, which it has been at various points, you slide auto Porter in there and suddenly you have half decent spacing and the stuff with Scotty as like a, a DHO hub, um, you know, as a, a, a role man, like all that stuff you're able to unlock. I think if you can survive defensively with him at center and they've not only survived to this point, they've thrived in those alignments. So that that's been a huge development for me. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think apart from that, it's it's been a lot of confirmation of stuff that I already believed. Sure. But those are still important data points and getting to see them bear out in the way that you thought they might, but couldn't be 100% sure that they would, has has felt very validating, right? It's like, oh, Scotty looks a whole lot better defending on the back line than he did at the point of attack. Go figure. Oh, <laughs> this team's defense can actually be really really Normal? effective <laughs> if you're just sort of staying solid and trusting guys to defend their individual assignments and like yeah mm-hmm. you can be aggressive sometimes you can shade extra help toward the ball but you're not sending three or four guys collapsing on every single drive and having guys press way up on ball handlers like that's you you can defend normally and this defense with all the individual defensive talent on it is going to be really good. Go figure, you know, like those are things that I believed would be the case, but now seeing it is still, you know, those are important things to actually know uh, and have the evidence that they can work in practice rather than just in principle. Um, And, and just sort of baked into that. I mentioned this on my show yesterday, uh, but like, I think it's been important to see that in terms of being able to generate transition offense, Mm -hmm. you can do that by forcing misses. You don't just have to do it by forcing turnovers. And so the Raptors have gone from allowing the second worst effective field goal percentage in the NBA. Like it's just, it will never stop boggling my mind that a team with as much defensive talent as last year's Raptors had allowed the second highest effective field goal percentage in the league. And this year, they're second best. So yeah. it's just a dramatic turnaround in that particular stat. I think they're getting a little bit lucky with opponent three-point shooting right now. But the change is palpable. And they're forcing way fewer turnovers. But that's been a worthwhile trade-off because they're forcing all these misses. And they're still able to run off of those defensive rebounds. Like their transition frequency, fifth in the league. Transition efficiency, first in the league. So to be able to scale back the aggressiveness on defense in a way that's been really beneficial without suffering for it at all in terms of your transition offense, really important thing to have learned. And again, early, all this stuff is subject to change, but that's one where I feel pretty confident that it's going to hold. Yeah. I mean, the, the defense I think has been sort of my, well, the, the thing I was most encouraged by coming into this season, for sure, it's the thing I thought was going to give them a pretty high floor, and I feel pretty vindicated having thought that, considering what we've seen, especially how it's feeling the offense. And I think kind of like an underrated part of why the transition game has been so good, too, just like on a per-possession basis, is that 
the guys who are now grabbing those boards and running these possessions, they're not Gary Trent Jr. on a steal. They're not Fred Van Vliet grabbing a steal and going the other way. They're just marauding incredible open court players in Scotty, Pascal, OG, Dennis Schroeder sometimes. Like, I feel like that's kind of an underrated little element of why their transition attack's been so bloody good as well. Like, they're making good on these opportunities as opposed to kind of pissing some away <laughs> like they would last year when it was different guys kind of operating the break. Um, they just haven't had that this year. And to the point of Scotty and just like everything that he's done, I do think for me, if we're kind of going back to the original question of like how things have changed sort of in my view of the team, you know, I think coming into the year, I was resigned to the idea that one of OG or Pascal is going to have to go. And, you know, I, my preference was to keep Pascal. I, I think maybe my whole like maybe trade OG thing is going to die forever. Every time I watch this dude play, I'm just like John the floor. Oh, my God, this guy is so unique. So good. Um, maybe you just pay him whatever it's going to take. And it's totally fine. And if that's the case, then maybe the Pascal thing becomes the the move, which we'll get to in a second, I'm sure. But I think I've allowed myself a little more room to believe that the three dudes can be the core, the backbone of a very good team with the proper context around them. I don't think they have that right now. But even with the sort of weird Pascal start to the season, the and we'll get to this, the sort of you know lack of imagination of getting him to the spots where he's going to cook. I think there's still room to massage that. And I think because Scotty can hang at center and, and make that three, four, five viable to close games and in big moments, um, because you, you know, Scotty seems to be on this track to eventually become the number one that we always said Pascal Siaka will be better playing next to. I think I've allowed myself a little more room to think, you know what, maybe that three is the answer and you figure out the rest later. It might not happen that way. There's still three months of sort of data points to collect here on how this works, but that's kind of, you know, I've gone from thinking there's like a 10% chance it all stays together and all three are on the team next year to, you know, 30, 40%. Like there's an avenue here where they overperform are very good and it's kind of undeniable by the time January comes around that, oh yeah, these three dudes are just incredible. When they're on the floor together, they win their minutes like hilariously. Why would you go and break that up? We've kind of uh, dipped into what I wanted to get into with Pascal and Scotty in segment two. We will do that and kind of continue this thread in just a moment. Before we do that, however, got to tell you, today's sponsor is Jace Medical. Look, uh, on this show, we like to spend a lot of time talking to one another. You and I, we get fired up on wins and losses, who starts, who sits. And I'm thankful for that connection we have today. Our chat's going to be a little more personal. Whether you're on extended travel, bracing for a major weather event, or limited by another supply shortage, you are covered thanks to our partners at Jace Medical with life-saving antibiotics and a long list of daily med medications that can be ordered in a one-year supply, even ED generics for Cialis, Viagra, and Revatio prescriptions as well. You can go online right now at jacemedical.com to receive your 12-month supply on your daily medication. Uh, this is great if you're someone who, you know, is again, is prone to supply shortages in an area where there might be natural disasters, or maybe you're just traveling, right? Like this is kind of the main thing for you. If you're traveling, you have an emergency, you lose your luggage, you don't have uh, you know, your, your, your proper access to medical care, you put it in your carry-on bag, you have this little Jace case with the, the antibiotics or the medications you need, and you are going to be all set in the event the worst happens. If you never have to use it, that is the optimal way for this to go. If you or someone you love would like to get some peace of mind and have a year's supply of any daily medication that you are reliant upon to keep to live your quality of life, go to jacemedical.com to see if it's offered for you. Remember to use the promo code Locked On for $20 off your purchase at jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. All right, we continue on here. Joe Wolf on at the score and pound the rock here. Uh, picking up the thread that we left off in the first segment on the idea of Pascal and Scotty and symbiosis uh, of you know being able to work in tandem to amplify one another and while i would love every single possession they run to be that sort of uh dueling post-ups and cuts thing they ran at one point in that mavs game uh you can't run an entire offense like that so they're gonna have to be other ways for those two dudes to find their spots i, I think joe i'm kind of unsure how i feel about the sort of general consensus i seem to find when i kind of talk to people whether it's in the raptors locked on raptors discord whether it's just like people who interact with the show offering their thoughts i feel like the consensus is that pascal and scotty operate too much in the same areas of the floor and therefore cannot fit with one another i don't know if i totally agree with that i think that's kind of reductive it simplifies it a little too much i think they each have little pockets of the floor areas of their game where there isn't that overlap 
I don't know if the Raptors have done a very good job of amplifying those, especially for Siakam so far this year, where it's been a lot of, okay, they're space over there and, you know, see what happens and see what comes to you within the flow. You know, obviously the Mavs game was great for the post-ups that he got. I don't think they're going to run into a team with as little rim protection as that Mavs roster did that that night without Derek Lively. Um, but I'm curious, Joe, like, you're Darko Ryakovich. You're trying to sprinkle in more Pascal and kind of get both of these guys working in spots where they can operate. You know, I, the sort of, oh, well, Pascal has a big game and Scotty, he's going to have a bad game. That's just kind of how it goes. Like, yes, that's sort of happened for most games this year where Scotty's popped off and Pascal hasn't. Scotty had 14 points on four or 15 in the game. Pascal was incredible on Wednesday. I don't think that is fair to say that that's just like a rule that only one can you know succeed while the other uh lives or whatever whatever the stupid harry potter thing is uh but like what where are you at with um you know ways in which they can sprinkle in more pascal siakam while also not kind of infringing upon scotty barnes and his breakout in the kind of areas where he operates i mean i really think we saw the blueprint in that mavs game and like you mentioned matchups are going to change how they have to use the different pieces offensively, but there most of the time you are going to be playing an opponent that gives you mismatch hunting opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think what we saw in that game that should be really encouraging both to the Raptors coaching staff and to us as fans is you can work in those Pascal post-ups in the flow of the offense mm -hmm. and you know so it's like one of the things that the raptors have been running a lot of split action like they enter the ball into the post there's a screen away two guys cut off of that and most of those kind of touches like the post touches with split action playing off of them have gone to like yak and scotty and i think in that game we saw more often them giving those touches to pascal and it's like if he has a matchup he likes and they're playing it in single coverage, well, then go ahead and attack that matchup. Mm -hmm. And at worst, like, yeah, maybe it's a static play, but you don't necessarily have uh, static spacing or static movement around it. Like you have guys making cuts and screens that are engaging help defenders, taking their eyes away from the central thing that you want to go to, which is Pascal attacking a single coverage matchup he likes mm -hmm. and i think that even just like the pace in which they were getting him those post touches like it was him sprinting the floor and getting deep seals or it was them you know like dennis hitting somebody with a back screen getting the switch immediately entering the, ba the ball to pascal and he's going to work right away like the pace in the offense can still be there mm -hmm. And if you run into a different defensive scheme where they're not willing to play those post-ups and single coverage, well, then Pascal can spit the ball out and get it moving around and somebody is going to find themselves with an advantage to attack. Mm -hmm. It's not going to look that good all the time, but there are certainly ways that you can incorporate his skills into your new offensive philosophy. And in terms of like specifically the pairing with Scotty and how that can work, You've got two guys who are really good and intuitive interior passes, passers. So mm -hmm. like there can be a lot of high low action between the two of those guys. That gets a little bit more difficult when Yak is out there as well. There's less space to be able to make those passes, but I think whether it's Pascal passing to Scotty or Scotty passing to pass uh, to Pascal, uh there I think there are going to be like there there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that hasn't quite been plucked mm -hmm. in terms of those two guys just being able to with their passing ability and with their interior scoring ability to be able to help themselves out and each other out in that way um so th that's like i i think like from the beginning of the season i was kind of feeling like if they're really not willing to go to this if they're not willing to play to Pascal's strengths because they feel like it veers too far away from what they're trying to do now offensively, then yeah, they should, they should try and trade him because it's mm -hmm. pointless. They're just not optimizing him at all. Sure. And they're using him in like, in a way that is just like not commensurate with his skill set and like using him in these movement sets, he's running around and screening and coming off of flares and things like that. 
Uh, and I just don't think that's like you could plug in, uh, you know, a Cam Johnson to that role <laughs> and and it would be more effective, frankly, than sure. the way that they were using Pascal. So that's why I was just like waiting for a game like this to to see, OK, like this is something that you're willing to do and you're recognizing that you can have a sort of marriage between these two different offensive ideals. For sure. And so the post-ups are one thing. The other thing Pascal we know was like pretty heavy on last season was, you know, isolation stuff, obviously, just kind of like finding a mismatch and going to work, you know, kind of more face up and kind of driving to the basket. Also, a little bit of pick and roll stuff, right? And obviously his pick and roll attack is not exactly uh, quick. It's more probing. It kind of lets things develop. I think a part of that probably was due to the lack of shooting around him the last couple of years when he was running all those pick and rolls. Like there's only so many quick reads to make when there uh, are a thousand in arms kind of in engulfing you in the middle of the floor. I'm curious to see a little bit more of Pascal kind of running pick and roll the way Dennis has been, right? Um, especially in those smaller lineups when Scotty's playing at the five. I know it's easy to switch, right? Like Pascal, Scotty, pick and roll. That's going to be something that teams, if you have the right defenders, can switch that. Not every team is going to have the right defenders to defend both Scotty and Pascal at the same time. Um, but if you have those lineups with a, an Otto Porter Jr. out there, with OG, with Gary Trent Jr., with even Dennis Schroeder, the way he's been, you know, killing the catch and shoot game, and we'll talk about Dennis in a bit here, but, you know, on the note of Dennis, like he's just kind of taken over all of Fred's touches. And I wonder if maybe there's a way to kind of funnel some of that creation burden to Pascal to put him in a spot where he can kind of, again, be in a place where he has succeeded in the past while playing within an offense that fits the ideals and the ethos of what Darko is looking for. And I do think like Scotty and Pascal running pick and roll with one another with shooting around them. There's something there. I mean, I, I don't know to what extent there is something there, but that feels like a way you can kind of work both of those guys with their skill sets in as well, where Scotty can do the short roll thing um, and, you know, just kind of present as a target for Pascal and pick and roll. And I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Am I like getting too fond for the days past of those long probing Pascal pick and rolls? Or do you think that's a way to have, again, their, their skills once again complement one another? It's tricky because it is going to be switchable a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, okay, there's not going to be a lot of teams that have perfect matchups for Pascal and Scotty. Well, then, I mean, you can just kind of find and isolate the matchup between those two guys that you like, and you don't even necessarily sure. need to run the pick and roll in order to get sure. to it. Like you'll already have it off of the bat. I'm still stuck on this possession that I saw in that Blazers game where there was a Pascal and Scotty pick and roll. The Blazers switched it, but Scotty slipped out. And I mean, like the pacing that they ran it with was just perfect, right? Mm -hmm. He slipped out and got underneath Jeremy Grant on the switch and Pascal immediately hit him with the pass over top. The tag came early from Shaden Sharp in the corner who just had a tremendous defensive possession and is like really leveling up as a defender. This is a tangent, but whatever <laughs> he came over, he was there to tag early. Scotty immediately kicks it to the corner. And if the Raptors spacing had been better then this play could have worked like gangbusters. Right. But Dennis and Grady were like right next to each other in right. the corner. They had messed up the spacing. If that's just Grady in the corner, then fantastic. Either, you get like, you know, you get a tag from the strong side instead. Uh, and it's like one pass away or that tag comes and you get a open corner three from one of your best shooters. But because of how it worked out, Grady had to relocate up to the top and they still managed to get the ball to him with space. Like uh, Dennis kicked it up back to Pascal on the wing who immediately swung it to Grady and he got to attack a closeout and get all the way to the rim. But unfortunately, Shaden Sharp comes over from the corner again <laughs> and swaps his layup at the rim. But that's the kind of stuff, if you want to have Pascal and Scotty running actions together, and you know the defense is liable to switch, it's like, you got to have the pacing of it nailed down, and the slips have to be there, and like you got to find counters to those switches. Apart from just, oh, okay, now, we ha now Scotty has the matchup advantage we like, and so let's dump the ball to him and see what he can do. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of pascal is a pick and roll ball handler you, you can't get around the fact that it's harder to do on this roster than it was in the past when kyle lowry and fred van vliet were here 
-hmm. not only as excellent screeners and like none of the Raptors guards on this roster screen nearly as well as those two guys do. Dennis has done, I think, a pretty good job of it, Mm -hmm. but he's not on the level of Kyle or Fred as a screener. And he's also just not nearly on the level of those guys as a threat popping out of those screens. So if the idea for the defense, which is usually going to be is, hey, let's hedge so that we don't have to give the switch here, then they're not as concerned about Dennis flaring out to the three-point line and Pascal kicking it to him for an open three. Mm -hmm. So that just makes it inherently more difficult. And then like with Gary, where maybe you would as a defense be worried about, uh, you know, him flaring out, ghosting out, whatever it is. Um, he, he just doesn't bring that same impact as a screener, right? And sure. isn't forcing those same kind of tough decisions on a defense probably. So that's where it gets tough because I think where Pascal has been most effective as a pick and roll ball handler is in the inverted actions. And I don't think it's as intuitive to run those with this roster now. So I, I think there are ways that they can incorporate more of it for sure. But I don't know, man, at the end of the day, they still they still have to reckon with the spacing concerns <laughs> and um i think those spacing concerns are part of the reason that getting pascal going in the post makes more sense than almost anything else because you're just sure. starting him closer to the basket like do you know what pascal is shooting on drives this year i don't i, I meant to look that up and i totally forgot because i'm bad at my job what do you got 22 percent 22 percent on drives grimy. like it's grimy yeah, it's a problem. So <laughs> um, that that's going to improve, obviously. And I do think there are ways that they can help improve that for him. But like, it's, you know, there, there are inherent challenges to to getting all these different things working in harmony with, with uh, this offense. And I think kind of keeping things simple sometimes and just, you know, uh, attacking a mismatch for a guy who's really good at attacking mismatches. And again, you can still get that in the flow of the offense. I think that just makes sense. For sure. I uh, mentioned Dennis Schroeder and his kind of role in all of this with the offense. I want to get into Dennis Schroeder coming up because we have not talked about him a ton. He's been very good for a mid-level exception signing, uh, well beyond, I think, most people's imaginations. He's having arguably the best season of his career so far through eight games uh you're gonna get into dennis schroeder what he's done so far what's sustainable what's not uh and just kind of do a little deep dive on what he's been doing for the raptors so far this year but joe we'll do that in just one second before we do that however got to tell you about our friends over at prize picks the single best play to go play daily fantasy sports it is the number one daily fantasy sports platform in north america for a reason it's the easiest most exciting way and all you got to do it's so so simple you're picking two to six players on any entry and you are picking more or less on their stat projection in a given category if you get it right that is great if you get six right on your entry you went up to 25 times your money it's that simple. And a night like tonight where the NBA in-season tournament's going on, there's some really fun games. You've got Anthony Edwards and Victor Wembanyama in a game between Joe and I's Wolves and the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, all sorts of stuff for you to go and peruse as far as stat projections for players on the sched for tonight. So go ahead and do it. Uh, you get quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types. It's all what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. They offer weekly promotions as well that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday. Each Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% to provide you even more value. And Prize Picks now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account this basketball season. Go and check out Prize Picks right now at prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit it match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash locked in NBA. Use the code locked in NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks is daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, we round out the show. Joe Wolfon of the wonderful Pound the Rod Rock podcast is here. Uh, closing things out. If you have not yet, listeners of the show, go back and listen to uh, the episode from yesterday where Jamar Hines and I broke down the game against the Mavericks. Uh, I talked about the bench earlier this week. We did a mailbag with Katie Heindel. We talked about the Spurs game with Big V on Monday. It's been a loaded week on the show. If you missed an episode, go back and check them out. And then again, subscribe, hit the little notification button so you never miss the episodes when they drop each and every day. Okay, Joe, 
Dennis Schroeder, he has been very good so far this season. 17 plus points, eight plus assists. He's shooting 40% on threes, 48% on four catch and shoot attempts per game. It's been kind of nutty. I don't know how much we can bank on the three point shooting continuing, uh, but there's been plenty of other good stuff with Dennis Schroeder as well. Um, I've really enjoyed that he can kind of just be a quick bucket for this team when things really bog down. He can kind of get a mat- mismatch and just say, all right. Jets on getting to the rim now, and he's shooting like 62% at the rim this season, which is well above where he's been for most of his career. Kind of the best he's been since that OKC season in 2019-20, the lauded year where he worked with Darko Ryakovich, and everyone was very happy all the time. Um, you know, I think his defense at the point of attack has been outstanding. You know, I, I think a pretty clear upgrade over what Fred Van Vliet was doing by the end of last season. Uh, Joe, impressions of Dennis Schroeder. How far above expectation has his performance been so far for you? Uh, and what are you kind of looking at as far as, you know, keeping an eye on various parts of his game as you know, when it comes to like regression back to the mean stuff mm-hmm. that could be sustainable. Give me your sort of readout on Dennis Schroeder's first eight games with the Raptors. Definitely above expectations. I mean, the defense is something that I did expect. Like I, I said, mm-hmm. I think there were a lot of people, at least like a subset of people who felt like he was going to be an improvement over Fred on the offensive side. Mm-hmm. And honestly, so far, he kind of has been. Hmm. But, well, I don't know about that, actually. it's Individually, yes. In terms of like the impact on the team offense, I'm not sure. But yeah. I, I always felt like the impact would be felt defensively. Because while he's not the team defender that Fred is, Fred last season was not near the point of attack stopper that Dennis has been. And like he's just sticky at the point mm-hmm. of attack. Like He really is able to kind of stay attached to ball handlers. And I think that has had a big impact as far as, yeah, if if what the Raptors want to try to do is send a little bit less help, just be more solid, then having a guy who's not getting wiped out on screens and is able to apply some ball pressure just sort of on his own without help, without getting blown by repeatedly, then that really helps in that endeavor. And I think Dennis has been fantastic in that respect. I also think, you know, we talked about the transition stuff a bit. Mm Mm-hmm. And he hasn't been a huge part of that as a scorer. But I think in terms of just being able to advance the ball up the floor sure, really quickly is like, I didn't think that necessarily we were going to see that from him. I feel like in the past, he's been a guy who has sort of wanted to walk it up or run the ball up the floor himself. And he's been instrumental, I think, in getting the Raptors a lot of these open court opportunities, even when they're not forcing turnovers, but like the ball is coming off of the rim and whether he's getting the rebound himself, which he's not doing very often, but you know, if it's yak getting the rebound immediately handing it to Dennis and Dennis is just like getting it up the floor in a hurry. It's really helping to kick that transition attack into gear. The playmaking in general, I think has been a big pleasant surprise. Like I Mm -hmm. didn't consider him to be a particularly good playmaker coming in. And in fact, I thought that was, going to be one of the big areas where this was a downgrade and i think his playmaking has been fantastic so all of that is stuff that that's impressed me and that can hopefully sustain itself um you know you mentioned the 48 percent on catch and shoot threes <laughs> that's going to come down and i think if you if you talk about like concerns and this is where it gets into like him versus fred on the offensive side Mm -hmm. Because right now, he's shooting the ball way better than Fred did last season. But defenses still aren't really adjusting to it. Yeah. And there's Uh, no pull-up game to speak of whatsoever. 16% on one attempt, which is basically in line with his career. Yeah, which is why he is like, you know, 0.7 points per possession as a pick-and-roll ball handler so far. 0.77, I have it right here, yeah. There you go, 0.77. So... Not great because yeah, he doesn't he doesn't have that pull up game to nearly the same extent. And even as a catch and shoot guy, where he is shooting forty eight percent, defenses are still mostly fine with giving him those looks and saying do your worst. And if he keeps doing this, maybe there will be an adjustment at some point. Mm-hmm. For now, it's great that he's hitting them, but it's not really helping to open up the floor for them. So yeah, that's uh, what I guess I'm keeping my eye on in terms of like, this is still an issue that they have to work around. But in terms of 
what he can do within his power. I mean, he's doing everything that you could ask of him right now. 100%. Um, he, there was a possession against the Mavs on Wednesday where I think the Mavs were zoning up and they were having a hard time kind of penetrating the zone. And then Dennis just kind of gets it, dribbles around, and then turns the Jets on and scores. And, oh, there's a zone buster we haven't seen the Raptors even remotely capable of in the last couple of years. Like, I, I'm really enjoying all the ancillary stuff from Dennis more than anything else. Like, yeah, the I would like to see a little bit less of a sort of domination from him in terms of initiation possessions on offense um you know i think he's just like right on par with what fred was as like the touch leader for the team last year uh leads the team ahead of scotty barnes by a smidge and you know i think because of the spacing because of the lack of a pull-up shot you know you're not seeing great offense come out of that i mean this is still the 29th ranked offense in the half court in the nba berkeley in the glass it's not good um and when Dennis Schroeder is the leading guy in touches on the team. Like, obviously, he has a big part in the way the offense is being defended. Um, so, I, you know, I think if you can capitalize on him being eager to bomb these threes and work him off the ball a little bit more, even if teams aren't going to guard him, I, you know, maybe there's some benefit there. Certainly, he's been a better off-ball sort of end-of-clock bailout option than Pascal Siakam has been so far this year. So maybe you can milk a couple extra points per possession that way. Um, but yeah, you know, it's hard to complain, right? He was put into a pretty tough context to be the point guard as a non-shooting, non-pull-up shooting point guard, at least on a team with one credible three-point shooter in the starting five. Maybe there's more than that. If Scotty Barnes levels off as like a 35, 36% guy, which, Hey, fingers crossed. He was hoping it doesn't regress back down to the mean all the way because the mean would be 29% for his career. (laughs) Um, but you know, I, I think, there's really nothing to complain about with what you've seen from Dennis Schroeder. And if anything, I think, you know, as good as he's been with, the, you know, with the knowledge you have him under contract this year and next, I know we are pining after the next lead guard for this Toronto Raptors team to pair with Scotty Barnes long term. But at least he kind of gives you a little bit of runway to figure that out and, and know that, OK, Dennis Schroeder is at least there being perfectly passable at minimum um as you sort of look for whoever that next guard is going to be um do you feel the same way or would you uh like still jump at the opportunity to go make a even even sort of like a win now we put your chips on the table type of trade for a guard to sort of maybe push dennis to the bench where he can kind of you know be the the orchestrator there with a second unit and get someone else in there to kind of be the lead guard long term. I mean, it, obviously they're going to have to figure that out at some point. He's in his 30s and he's on a two year deal, but uh, it does feel like they have a bit more of a time to figure that out and evaluate that 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 sort of need. Would, it, would you say like would you agree with that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think I would be hesitant to make a win now trade. Like if there is a lead guard out there that's available for whatever reason, who's young and could be part of the long-term picture then yeah of course i would jump at that opportunity sure by win now uh, you, i mean you know like, all you about my emmanuel quickly picks fetish, for, but. yeah that's the thing emmanuel quickly like by win now i mean you give up future picks to get a guy like that to pair with scotty and kind of get that set in stone i just it just depends on the guy yeah um but i think for now i'm perfectly fine kind of riding this out with dennis and i he's you know, again, been a perfectly acceptable, like more than acceptable. He's been a great stopgap if that's mm-hmm. what he winds up being. And yeah, I mean, if you find a way to get that lead guard in the door this year or next year, and Scotty's uh, or and Dennis is still around to be like your backup point guard, I mean, you're laughing Hell at yeah. that point. Um, but it just it just depends on the deal, like what the framework looks like. But I mean, again, if if you are exploring a Pascal trade, then to me, finding a guy who can be that lead guard is what you're looking to get. 100%. So if it comes to that, then yeah, I'm not letting what Dennis has done to this point get in the way of me pursuing a, you know, a guard that I can see being part of the long-term picture. No way. But it's great that he's done what he's done so far and has made you feel like you can be reasonably competitive in the present with him as your starting point guard. And yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you mentioned like the, the touch time stuff, right? Like he's actually touching the ball more than Fred did last year. He's at (laughs) 6.6 minutes per game of possession. Fred was at 6.4 minutes last year. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Like, you know, you're talking about wanting to maybe shuffle some of those possessions Pascal's way. 
uh, maybe you could do that. But I think in terms of just like keeping the half court offense sort of organized and sure, you know, you have the, the Dennis Jakob pick and roll, which as we mentioned, hasn't been great in terms of its efficiency for Dennis himself. But I think one of my big concerns coming into this season was where does all of this leave Jakob in the offense? Does he have a pick and roll partner who can help get him going? And I think to that point, Dennis has been pretty effective in the pick and roll because, you know, he's not in the way that Fred did maybe like able to draw like a big man up to the level of the screen because you're worried about his pull-up threat. But his downhill pressure is still able to usually draw a couple of guys with him. And then that's opening Yak up on the roll a lot of the time. And it's getting him actually roll opportunities closer to the basket than what Fred was able to do for him. So mm-hmm. less four on three playmaking opportunities, but more opportunities to finish on the roll. Yeah. And like um, Pascal is excellent at kind of seeping into those little pockets of space too, and kind of presenting a target as well. So yeah, sure. it's like an unorthodox pairing, but there's been some success there. You know, I guess like my sort of last thing on Dennis is that, um, well, two last things. One, boy, oh boy, they cannot afford for him to miss any time. Uh, as, as interesting as Malachi Flynn has been of late in his bench duties, uh, you're asking a lot of Dennis Schroeder. And, you know, he's been reasonably durable in his career, I guess. Like, he's not, like, had any massive swaths of time missed. But, you know, 15 games here, 20 games there, like... It's happened, and if that happens, they are screwed. <laughs> like it's, I mean, yeah. unless Scotty can actually just kind of like put the team on his back as like the lead dude and make it work, which is a lot to ask of a dude, even as well as he's played, that could be a bit of a trouble spot. Um, so that's kind of like one thought. The last thought, though, is it's really nice having a heel on the team, Joe. I've missed having a heel and boy, oh boy, is he a heel. Our, our pal Nick Angstaff from Locked On Mavs texted me during that game Wednesday. He was like, God damn it. I hate Dennis Schroeder. <laughs> and it's like, yes, yes, guy. This is what we want. Uh, Joe, uh, as I totally expected, we have gone uh, well over the allotted time that we gave ourselves to do the podcast, but I could talk to you about this stuff all day. You're the very, very best in the biz. So uh, thank you for carving out so much time to chat. Uh, do you have anything you want to promote for the good people out there? Uh, I mean, I, I kind of fleshed out a lot of my thoughts about the Raptors offense uh, a couple weeks back. Uh, so I wrote a piece about it at the score, talked to Darko a little bit for that story. I think it's pretty good. Um, so that's pinned on my Twitter page if you want to check it out. All my stuff uh, at the score, I usually tweet out Joey underscore W. The most recent piece I wrote was about the Dame Giannis two man game and how it's not really clicking and why it's not really clicking. Um, Check out Pound the Rock. Subscribe if you like what you hear. That's uh, my weekly NBA podcast with Joe Cash. And yeah, I think that's uh, that's all I can say right now. Hell yeah. Uh, Everyone go support Joe. Listen to Pound the Rock. It's the very best. Uh, And Joe knows what the hell he's talking about. That's why we bring him on the show, to level up the level of intelligence on the program. Uh, You can find... Me over on the internet at Woodley Sean on Twitter or whatever we call it these days. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. Try to do more in terms of posting stuff on the Instagram page because it's 2023 and we have to do that. Um, including my what should be hopefully mostly nightly, at least during the week, uh, takes from my basketball watching chair. Uh, you can find that over on the Locked On Raptors Instagram and of course the Discord server. The link is in the description. Come hang out. It's free to do and it's a great little community we got building around the the show so come hang out in there we will talk to you again on monday break down the game against the boston celtics look ahead to the week that lies before us uh until then they'll have a wonderful rest of your weekend enjoy the game saturday bye-bye thanks for hanging